Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Praveen and Meghla, for the introduction and for inviting me to give a talk. Uh, I think uh, almost everybody who's attending the talk now has probably attended my last talk uh, last week. There, just to recap, we talked about astronomy and how it developed historically as a method uh, through observations of the positions and the change in the positions of the sun, the moon, the stars, etc. in the sky over various time periods, over the periods of a day to a week to month to a year to even hundreds of years, and how as we try to explain, as, as humanity tried to explain these various motions, uh, the models they had to come up with had to become more and more refined uh, or more and more complex uh, because uh, they were discovering more and more perturbations or more and more phenomenon adding to what they thought was a very simple uh, structure early on. And uh, and a lot of this was done through observations and modeling, which is just arithmetic modeling. At some point when physics started with you know Galileo and Newton and so on, we could then come up with theories to explain why they move the way they move, which of course led to a much much better predictive power. And and in some sense, the kinematics turned into dynamics, uh, applying Newton's laws of motion and gravity. Uh, today, we'll take it a step further. And we'll talk of astrophysics. Uh, the difference between astronomy and astrophysics is, is non-existent or vague, depending on who you talk to. Uh, I, for the purpose of this talk, I will define astrophysics as astronomy plus spectroscopy. Uh, spectroscopy, why is that? I'll come to now and explain to you. Before that, uh, I think all of you have seen this video, which was uh, released today, which is the first uh, uh, images from uh, Chandrayaan-3 of the moon taken from the lander camera, as Vegla told me, and this is taken during Perilun, or when the orbit, the very eccentric orbit of Chandrayaan-3 is passing closest to the moon. And it was taken on August 5th, and I think it got released today, and I think it was fantastic, and I thought we would start off with this video just to kind of you know, motivate you and to kind of congratulate ISRO on their progress so far and wish them all success in uh, in the lander and the rover uh, functioning in the, in the weeks to come. Uh, so, we're going to talk about spectroscopy and how spectroscopy gave rise to the birth of astrophysics. What you're seeing in the background is the sun, spectrum of the sun. The spectrum of the sun, of course, goes from red to violet, and it's a huge, long thing. Uh, we have wrapped up the spectrum into lines, just to kind of fit it to the screen and show you better. We can immediately see that, of course, spectrum of the sun has all colors, like Newton famously showed, but there are dark lines in between, and the dark lines is where the physics lies, and we'll come to that very soon. Uh, so, like I said, 1800s, still early 1800s, astronomy is all about positions and motions, and there was no way to know what the objects are made of. What was a star? What was it made of? Was it burning coal, like we burn coal on Earth? What are planets made of? Uh, how, how, the, what is the chemical composition? How hot is the sun? How hot are the stars? And so on. We had no idea, right? Because we could not go and measure things. The spectroscopy changed all that. Now, the history of spectroscopy is linked intimately with the history of astronomy. And they kind of go together, and that's a talk by itself. Uh, but I'll briefly summarize something which I think I guess most of you know. Uh, a lot of work on the initial uh, understanding spectra came from Kirchhoff and later Bun and Bunsen as well. So what they what, at some point before that in 1600s, Dalton and Lavoisier etc. Uh, they came to understand that matter as we know it is made of individual elements, and they knew around 30, 40 elements within 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 a, within a few decades. Uh, namely hydrogen, helium, no, hydrogen, sorry, hydrogen, lithium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, etc. Calcium were discovered pretty soon, and they knew that these were individual atoms, or individual elements, not elements, and that they could not be broken down into further things, and things we know of around the world are made from them, but they had no understanding of why there was so. Uh, then Bunsen, of course, heated stuff in his burner and then showed that the various kinds of elements produce various kinds of light and so on. Kirchhoff, and then there are a lot of a lot of uh, interesting things uh, happened in, in the meantime. And then Kirchhoff ultimately put everything together and said, look, if you if you look at an incandescent source, like you burn something uh, very hot, burn like an incandescent thing, like a piece of metal or something, it's going to emit light in all wavelengths. And that's the, that's the uh, if you look at the left-hand side image, what you see at the bottom left, the band of colors like a rainbow, is what you see, what is called the continuous spectrum. And we had talked about it in the previous lecture as a black body radiation. From, from any incandescent source, right? And this has all colors. And how do you get this? You pass it through a prism or a grating, like Newton famously showed. Now, people already knew uh, through studies by Fraunhofer earlier on that if you look at the spectrum of the sun, uh, like I showed you before, there were these dark lines, right? And they had no idea what they were. 
Then people later realize, Kirchhoff realized also, that if you have an incandescent bright source in the lab and then you have cold gas in front, cold gas would be, you know, some sodium or oxygen or something in, in, in a glass jar in the middle, then, then you, could, you would see dark lines again, like what you see on the right side figure, right? So you see the incandescent light as this was, superposed on that are these dark lines. Now, if you looked at this cloud of gas and you heated it up by itself and removed the incandescent source, you have you had the same lines, but as emission or bright lines. So this is what Kirchhoff showed, and then he and then he came up with some theories as to why that is so, and, and he gave his famous Kirchhoff laws, not the electricity laws, but laws about the about, about spectrum formation as well. Right? Soon after that, people found that different elements had different lines. You see on the right side uh, that if you look at if you if you if you, if you heat up certain gas or made of certain elements, pure elements, then each of them have a different signature, and these are like fingerprints of the element, right? So if so, anywhere there is carbon, you'll have the spectral lines corresponding to carbon, and vice versa, which is that anytime you see the spectral lines corresponding to carbon, you know that there is carbon. So, right? And therefore, people put these together, and then they understood that, therefore, sitting on Earth, you could look at the spectrum from the sun or the stars, and you could therefore uh, figure out what elements were there. This was a revolutionary idea, right? Kirchhoff and Bunsen, when they realized that they could sit on Earth, and they could actually, uh, actually determine the chemical composition of the sun, they apparently famously said this. Kirchhoff told Bunsen, I've gone mad. And Bunsen said, yes, so have I. And this was said when they had observed this famous fire in Mannheim from Stuttgart and where they could actually, they pointed the spectroscope to the fire and they could actually figure out what elements are burning, right? Soon, and, and much much after that, people did not know why, why the different elements have different uh, spectral lines, etc. Bohr then came up with this theory. Uh, of, of the of the atom, where he didn't explain why they are lines, but he could explain the frequent where the frequency of the lines were. Right? For example, we all know about the hydrogen a Bohr model of the hydrogen atom and so on. Uh, similarly, and and then in the, in the meantime, they, people are looking at various kinds of stars, and this is again something I alluded to in the previous lecture. And they divided, and then these stars had different colors, like we saw, uh, saw before, and different colors meant different temperatures. The blue the star, the hotter it was. They also happen to have different spectral lines, right? So, for example, they divided the stars into spectral classes called OBA, GK, GKM, and so on. And each each spectrum here is a spectrum of a typical star in that classification, right? And there are numbers of it. You can forget the numbers, right? So you can you can look and see spectral the dark lines occurring in each of the star spectrum is different for different classes, and different classes also mean different temperatures. So, so clearly, uh, stars at different temperature have different spectral lines. Nobody knew why, right? All of this was kind of put together by Meghna Saha, later Cecilia Payne Geposhkin, who used Saha equation in her thesis. Uh, Meghna Saha famously showed, so people thought at some point that the, the composition of the sun was the same as what is Earth, as that of Earth. People thought sun and the Earth were, had similar chemical composition. There was no reason to believe otherwise. And people also, since we, they had, since, since each stellar spectrum showed different, uh, different lines, only a few of these spectral lines were identified with the corresponding spectral lines of elements on Earth, right? And uh, some spectral lines on in stars did not have an identifiable element on Earth, so therefore they thought they had they had discovered new new elements, so named them nebulium and, and coronium and various elements, right? So people also thought that uh, that each of these spectral each star had different elements, right? Some of them probably not known and so on. Now Meghna Zaha came up; he married thermodynamic and 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 quantum quantum theory, which was fairly new at the time, and he was able to show for the first time that all of these spectral lines are occur from similar elemental comp abundances, they make similar elemental composition. The difference lies in the fact that with different temperatures, different elements are ionized at different rates, right? So, for example, some very hot temperature, you might have oxygen for four. So uh, four oxygen having been ionized four times or five times, lesser temperature could be three times or two times and so on. And therefore, as you increase the temperature, if you take a given atom, more and more electrons will be kicked out because of this kinetic of energy of collisions, right? And these collisions will then make an, an atom more and more ionized as you increase the temperature. And he was able to predict, or he was able to derive his famous Saha equation, which was refined later by other people, which, which led you to predict the ionization states of different elements given the temperature. So now you could, now everything was fine, right? Now you could just vary the temperature, predict the ionization states of different elements, and then they could, and then he could show that the different spectral lines occurring 
where just the spectral lines of various ionized species are the same elements rather than new elements, right? So, for example, uh, I think nebulium, which was a new element hypothesized, which has occurred in, in nebula or gaseous clouds, was shown just to be, I think, triply oxy ionized oxygen and so on and so forth, right? I forget the exact correspondence. So each of the new elements they thought they discovered because they had spectral lines which they could not observe on Earth in the lab were shown to be just ionized species of known elements. And this was fantastic. This was a huge revolution, right? And therefore, elemental abundance in various stars are roughly the same. We could show that. And different ionization states lead to different spectral classes and therefore different spectral lines. So therefore, he could unite all the observations into a single model and he could he told you how to predict them by kind of varying thermodynamics and thermal equilibrium uh, with uh, quantum quantum theory. Right? This was this was a revolution. Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin was a PhD student. She then used the half equation and looked at the solar spectrum. Now, people, like I said, thought that the sun and the earth were made, had similar elemental composition. She showed by applying the half equation that that's not true, that the sun was almost primarily hydrogen with some helium and very little, very little amounts of elements which we know on earth, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, potassium, calcium, and so on. This again was new. People do not believe it. Her own supervisor told her she must be wrong. She also agreed that she might be wrong. She published a thesis. And later, she, she and others showed that, no, actually, she was right, that uh, the sun is predominantly made of hydrogen as opposed to what Earth is made of. And all of these, in some sense, revolutions, or what now we know is obvious, but that time where totally new uh, understandings of perspectives of the universe came up because of, of spectroscopy. Right? Uh, and that, that, that's why I say, that's why people say spectroscopy, uh, uh, spectroscopy led to the birth of astrophysics and so on. So what does spectroscopy do for us? Now, spectro you all know how a spectral line is caused. I have, I'm not going into it because I'm assuming you all read that in school. Namely, you know, if you have an atom and, and an electron makes a jump at the atom, the electron energy level is quantized in atoms because of the quantum mechanics tells you that. And if an electron makes a jump between one level and the other, the energy difference is either emitted or absorbed as a photon whose frequency corresponds to the energy difference. The energy difference will be h nu, and nu is the frequency of the emitted photon, right? And that's how you get emission spectra and, and correspondingly uh, absorption spectra. So if you have a spectral line, you, you usually it's a nice little spectral line, let's say, and there's a peak of the spectral line, you know how strong the spectral line is. In some units of, of, of intensity, let's say, you know where the spectral line occurs, you know where the peak, uh, the frequency where the peak of the line is, right? That's the frequency of the spectral line. And you know how wide the spectral line is. It's not, it's not a single fun delta function. It, it has a particular width and a shape, right? Forget the shape of the spectral line for all. Let's assume a spectral line is Gaussian, right? Then you'll have a width or the full width half maximum. You'll have the peak and you'll have the frequency where it occurs, right? This, this itself is enough to tell you a lot of things about the gas emitting, right? So on, in figure one, what I'm showing you is, is, is the spectrum of uh, M42, which you all know as Orion Nebula. And you can see the emission lines, which are, which are strong and go vertical. And they mark, and here it's marked which line comes from which elements, right? So, for example, H alpha, then helium one, then O3, H beta, H gamma, H delta, etc. H alpha, H beta, H gamma, H delta, etc. You might know as the uh, as the line in hydrogen, of course, which which you can predict the frequency you can predict using the both the both theory, right? Uh, both atomic theory. Figure two is is again uh, the image. Okay, so this is a bit interesting. The figure two is of a planetary nebula, and they look like a ring. That's why you have these rings. Now, now you have a spectrum of the planetary nebula in such a way that you can make an image of the planetary nebula at every frequency. Right? Therefore, you can have the image of the planetary nebula in, in various colors. And you can see wherever the spectral line is present, it's very, very bright. And again, then you can make out the image of the spectrum of the planetary nebula in oxygen three line, helium two line, helium one line, O one line, and so on and so forth. Right? And therefore, you can now see uh, where inside the nebula each spectral line is occurring, how bright it is, how wide the line is. This, Etc. And then kind of try and figure out how much, how many oxygen atoms are there, how many helium atoms are there, and so on. Now, spectral lines can get very complicated. If you look at Figure Three, it's a spectrum using the ALMA telescope, which is a double meter telescope in Atacama, and this is a very, very small part of the spectrum towards the star-forming region or a molecular cloud. Uh, in, in look at the frequency, right? It's, it's in submillimeters, and each of these lines is marked which molecule it's from. Now, these lines are from molecules, not atoms, right? And you can see that the molecules are fairly complex, right? So you have lines from very complex uh, molecules as well. And I can't help but show you figure four. Figure four is 
a drawing made by Norman Foxton and is very uh, and is relevant to us because Norman Foxton was the director of the Madras Observatory, which later became IIA, and he had gone along with Pierre Janssen. Uh, he had gone to Guntur, Pierre Janssen had gone to Machili in Andhra Pradesh in 1868 to to search for emission lines in the from the corona of the sun when there was a total solar eclipse on 18th August, and he in the process discovered helium. Right, so there was a huge controversy about whether Pierre Janssen discovered helium or Norman Foxton did. Ultimately, it was resolved recently. Foxton was the first to note the presence of a new cycle line in the corona, this now, which we now know as helium. And if you didn't know, helium was discovered actually from the sun first, before it was discovered on Earth, and was discovered in Andhra Pradesh uh, in 1868. So that was interesting. And of course, we all know about the James Webb Space Telescope, which has been doing amazing work. Here are examples in a, in a, in a, in a gravitational lens field of four very, very different galaxies whose spectra are shown. And based on the spectral lines, we even the the uh, the 13.1 billion years thing, which is mass at the bottom, is a galaxy which is a redshift of 8.5 or so on. One of the one of the highest uh, redshifts from there we observe spectral lines from. And therefore, you know, the spectral lines are now given us almost everything we know about astrophysics. Right? Now, I told you a spectral line has a peak frequency, and I think all of you studied about Doppler effect. You all know about redshifts and so on. So let's now look at what Doppler effect has taught us uh, about astronomy. Uh, I'm just going to take a few examples uh, just to kind of give you a flavor of, of the kind of science which is which we learned uh, by applying the Doppler effect to pretty much spectral lines, right? So we all know Doppler effect happens when so there's a relative velocity between the emitter of a, of a wave and the and observer of the wave. Uh, let's say a, a horn of a car and you, for example. Then the frequency of the wavelength of, of the wave shifts, right? And uh, and this is uh, this is explained very very uh, very easily in a school textbook, so I won't go into it too much. Uh, but the point is that uh, if if the red, if the source is moving away from you, then the frequency decreases. When the source is moving towards you, the frequency seems to increase, right? And this happens to all waves, right? So it happens to sound, of course, but it also happens to light. So light is a wave as well, right? Now, what what do you mean by then Doppler effect in light? What what you mean is that if something is emitting light and it's moving away from you. Then the frequency decreases, which means the entire amount, entire light spectrum it emits moves towards the red. The entire light, right, which includes the continuum. Or whether the continuum light moves towards the red or the blue, you can't tell the difference. But then, luckily, we have spectral lines, and therefore spectral lines will also move towards the red or the blue. Which, that is, the frequency of the spectral light, where the peak of the spectral line occurs, will then change. Will then change depending on whether the source is moving towards the or away from. And if the source is moving away from you, the frequency of the spectral line decreases, and therefore it's called a red shift because it moves towards the red. And if and if it's moving towards you, then it's called a blue shift because the lines are moving towards the blue. And uh, this formula here tells you, you know, uh, uh, how they are related, right? So the the higher the velocity, the larger is the shifted frequency. And this is something which has been used, of course, in astronomy everywhere. And of course, the larger the the larger the velocity, higher the shift. And on the left, you see, for example, the bottom is the laboratory reference spectrum. A nearby galaxy is moving at slightly some velocity, they shifted a little bit. A distant galaxy is moving even higher velocity away from us, they shifted even more. And even more distant galaxy, they shifted much, much more, right? And on the right, you see an example spectrum in the infrared taken from a small part of the infrared spectrum taken from the sun, which is in green, and octopus, which is in red. And you can tell that all, the entire spectrum is shifted, right? This is an absorption spectrum as opposed to an emission spectrum. Now, for Arthur's, the red lines, they are they are shifted towards which direction? They're shifted towards higher wavelength, right, a smaller frequency. Therefore, the red shifted, which means Arthur is moving away from us. And no, by measuring the shift in the frequency, you can tell at what velocity Arthur is moving away from us, right? And this is basically Doppler effect in astronomy. So now, what all can we do with it? Now, now if you can measure how fast something is moving away or towards us, then, then you have a handle, of course, on, on predicting its motion. But you can also then pick, try and answer why it is doing so, right? So now, why do things move? Things move because of two reasons. Maybe because they have an innate velocity, which is given by some initial condition. Or, and these velocities are also affected by the gravitational interaction between various objects, right? So therefore, gravitational attraction will change orbit and so on. And therefore, kinematics, like I said, is linked to dynamics. And therefore, if you know the velocities, you can also then try and figure out what is causing those velocities, or what is causing those velocities to be constant or changing. And therefore, you can arrive at dynamics, and therefore, for the mass of the object, right? On the left, you see, for example, uh, the structure of a Milky Way. Uh, Doppler effect was very, very helpful initially in working out how the Milky Way structure is. Uh, you could, because of these spectral lines, which you know occur in the radio, for example, 
uh, we could delineate individual spectral uh, spiral arms in the galaxy. And this is an actual map of the spiral arms of the galaxy with the names marked, which are known through observations, partly through Doppler, Doppler shift of the spectral lines emitted by the gas in these spiral arms. Right? So that's something we're Now I'm going to talk. About, I'm going to talk about talk to you a little bit about something which is a bit more complicated, and the reason I'm doing so, though I don't have the background for it, the reason I'm doing so is because it illustrates very, very well what Doppler effect can do for you. So let's so bear with me. Let's walk through it a bit. Okay. In the middle, you see an optical picture of triangular galaxy M33. Now, you can look at it in the uh, radio. Right? The radio image of it is not very great. It, you, know, it, you see some, some emission. But then, you remember, we have spectral lines in the optical. We also have spectral lines in the radio. And the most important spectral line in the radio is at 21 centimeters or 1.4 gigahertz. It's due to a spectral uh, hyperfine splitting of the, of, uh, in the hydrogen, neutral hydrogen atom. And so, wherever you have a neutral hydrogen atom, you will have a spectral line at 21 centimeters, typical, right? Wavelength of 1420 megahertz in frequency. Now you can then look at the peak of the line, how strong these lines are. So you can look at, so now in the radio, you can measure the spectrum to every point in the galaxy, every line of sight, and figure out how bright it is, the, the spectral line is, and that map is on the right side. So wherever it is very, very, there is yellow or brighter, that tells you that there is more, more uh, the peak of the spectral line is higher, and therefore there's more hydrogen there, right? So the right-hand side map tells you where there is more neutral hydrogen. Now, this is this comes from the intensity of the spectral line at each pixel. But I told you spectral lines also have a, a, have a position or a frequency, right? Which, which is famously a Doppler effect. Now, we can also measure the Doppler shift at each pixel, right? So you have a spectrum at each pixel. The intensity of each spectrum maps the right-side figure. You can also then look at the shift in frequency. Now, the entire galaxy is moving away from you. Of course, you would expect that the end, all the spectra are shifted uniformly, right? Therefore, you wouldn't see much. But that is not entirely true. The galaxy is also rotating like our galaxy is. And therefore, some parts of the galaxy are coming towards you. Some parts of the galaxy are going away from you. The parts of the galaxy coming towards you will be blue shifted, or the spectral line will come at higher frequency. And the part of the galaxy moving away from you, the gas is moving away from you, and therefore, the, the spectrum of the gas of the part of the galaxy moving away from you will be redshifted or will be at lower frequency. Therefore, now we can then therefore uh, measure the shift in the frequency at each pixel and you can color code the shift in the frequency as red and blue and you have the image, image in the center. The left, hand, left side image is the same as the previous image. It's a map of the intensity of the spectral light. The middle image is the map of the shift in the frequency of the spectral light. And it's color coded to be blue if it's moving away from you, and more red if it's coming away from towards you. And now you can see very obviously that the galaxy is rotating, right? Because the top part is moving towards you, the bottom part is moving away from you. It's rotating. You know the inclination of the galaxy. You can then model the galaxy's rotation, and you can get its dynamical mass and so on. Now, now therefore, you can. This picture gives you directly uh, the most the rotation of the galaxy. The rotation of the galaxy is not exactly uniform. Different parts of the galaxy might have slightly precise perturbations, all of that, now you can study using it. Right? And a typical spectral line through any one pixel of this galaxy is giving on the, given on the right side, uh, and just, just to kind of let you know how it looks like. Right? So this is something which is amazing, I think, and that's why I went through this, though it's a bit complicated, because now you can look at rotation, you can look at deviations from uniform rotation and things like that, right? and that tells you a lot about the mass. So let's move on. Uh, now, I told you in the galaxy, the things move, you can get the rotation because some part is moving towards you, some part is moving away from you. So that is also true in other systems, right? So, for example, if you have two stars going around each other far away from you, and you're observing from the bottom, or look at the left side, right? And 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 you're in the plane, you're in the you're in the you're in the in the, the plane of rotation is towards you, right? So it's it's, it's the edge on, right? Now, obviously, once they, as they go around each other, star A, the yellow star, when the yellow star is to, coming towards you, the spectral line from the yellow star will be uh, uh, blue shifted. And when the yellow star is going away from you, the spectral line from the yellow star will be red shifted. And same thing for the red star. Now, of course, now if both the stars are light, obviously, and you get spectral lines of each star, and you can tell apart the spectral lines of each star, then you'll find that the spectral line of A, when it moves red, the spectral line of B moves blue. And when the spectral line, and, and, and again, vice versa, right? So it keeps going, doing this dance like this, right? I hope you can see my hand. I'm not sure whether you can see my hand. And that's illustrated in the right figure, right? This exaggerated, of course, spectral lines don't move this, this much. But as, as the stars move around each other, edge on, 
the the spectral line for each star will do this dance of redshift blue shift and redshift blue shift but because they're going around each other when the when one star is red shifted the other star is blue shifted and vice versa now if the two stars are of roughly equal mass then the shift is the same right how much ever the a red star a is red shifted the same amount of shift will be there in star b and so on but supposing one of but supposing the very unequal mass what happens if star a is actually a star and b is just a small planet going around a right now of course you can't see spectra from planet b because planet spectra is okay. all you can see is a spectrum from the star a right and that's in some sense is what's happening on the right side now you know that in our solar system that almost all the mass is in the sun so 99.9 plus percentage of the mass of the solar system is in the sun but and therefore you would assume that you know we study we say oh everything goes on the sun right all planets go around the sun and so on it's not entirely true because there is some mass uh, in the other planets so the amount of mass in the other planets are, is very 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 small remember planets are far away right and the if you look at the center of mass of our solar system that is actually outside the sun just outside the sun and therefore as you know things move around the center of mass right and therefore the sun also rotates goes around the center of mass of the solar system sun also therefore rotates around the center of mass which is just outside the sun this is not something you learn about in school but this is true and when we look at observations of planets you have to correct for this right and and therefore and and jupiter is much more massive than the center of mass would be much more outside the sun if, if jupiter was much more distant so you can work out what happens to the past, then then it will be even more outside the sun right and therefore how much the center of mass is outside the sun will be determined by how massive the planet is and how far away now and therefore that determines also how much is the motion of the star around the center of mass right the center is the planet's mass is very very small the center of mass is inside the star then the star will rotate but then the rotation will be rotation velocity will be far less than you want tell right you can't tell therefore if you have if you have stars elsewhere with planets around them called exoplanets right and and these planets are heavy enough and far enough away from the parent star that the center of mass is sufficiently away from the center of the star and the star's rotation around the center of mass then becomes substantial then all you see of course is the light from the star right but then you and the spectral light from the star now as the star moves around the center of mass the same thing happens which we saw before which is that the spectral light from the star will also be red shifted and blue shifted but far 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 less than the previous case because the motion of the sun is, of the star is very much smaller right the velocity is much smaller because the center of mass is very close to the center of the sun this is this this is this this is called the radial velocity method of detecting exoplanets and many exoplanets have been detected by this method so you look at nearby stars you look at the spectral lines and you look at the spectral lines over time the, and you and you carefully determine very accurately the peak of a spectral line the frequency where it peaks and you see the frequency changes over days or months or or years and if it changes regularly then you know that the star is moving around a uh, center and if you go if you can't see light from any other part then you know that the other part is other other object is is not that massive and not very bright and you can calculate the mass of the other object and if it comes out to be very small you know it's a planet right and in fact the first planet discovered outside the solar system is 51 pegasi which is the thing in the blue and what if the blue the graph in the blue actually shows you data of the velocity so the velocity is a meter per second and goes from minus 50 to roughly 50 meter per second and this is the velocity of the star as it rotates around the common center of mass between it and the planet as derived from the doppler shift of the spectral line of the star itself and another example is given on the right side of 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 a star called 18 delphinus due to the presence of its planet called 18 delphinus right i hope i'm clear it's not a big asking question so i explain this again so so doppler effect in the star due to its motion because of its planets is, is one way of detecting its planets and and many hundreds of them have been detected so far based on let's go a bit further out now i told you about galaxy rotation if you remember the central figure tells you how this external galaxy this galaxy called m33 or the triangular galaxy rotates around its own center now the same thing happens uh, to all galaxies right? including our own galaxy not a galaxy now now obviously if you know now in our own solar system because all the mass is essentially in the center right in the sun uh, kepler's laws uh, are applicable and they are very easy to to write down 
and we know the Kepler's three laws, and we also know the third law, which tells you that as you go away from the central mass of the star, the velocity decreases, right? And we know how the velocity is, a q proportion t square, right? Now, therefore, and therefore, and that's because the mass inside the planet orbit is constant, only going farther and farther away, and therefore the gravity, gravitational force decreases, and then that leads to this a q proportion t squared law because gravity is one over r. Okay. Now, now, the, now, but then supposing you have a galaxy. Now, it's not, it's not true that all the mass in the galaxy is the center, right? There's mass throughout the galaxy. And therefore, stars also will go around the galaxy, like our sun does. Right? Which, and, the, and the motion of the star around the galaxy is determined by the amount of mass inside the orbit of that star, right? So all the mass of, of the galaxy. And therefore, as we move away from the center of the galaxy, there's more and more mass, right? And then therefore, the, and, and that determines the orbit of each of these stars. But then beyond the point, of course, you expect that the mass reduces because the total mass inside remains constant because you're going far out of the galaxy. And once it remains constant, then the velocity will start dipping the same way as our planet's velocity do. Right? And therefore, if you look at the left-hand side curve, the blue curve is what you expect. Right? Because as you go outwards, the mass inside the orbit increases, the velocity increases, increases, increases. At some point, there is no more new mass being added inside the orbit because you kind of cross the galaxy. And therefore, then the velocity kind of, kind of goes down. But what is observed is the red line on the left. Right? So what is observed is at some point the velocity goes up and then it remains constant in the orbit, right? And on the right side is the data from our own Milky Way and, it, and, and the IRO mass by the sun is and far beyond the sun. You can see that the velocity is constant. Velocity is constant and doesn't go down means there is more. Then if you look at the orbit of a star which is at 15 kcc, there is still mass which is even more than inside the orbit of the sun, right? And therefore there's much more mass outside sun's orbit than we thought there was, which is what is causing the velocities not to decrease, but to be constant or maybe even increase. Right? This is one of the first strong evidences for dark matter, and this was shown by Vera Rubin, uh, after whom the LSST telescope is now named. Right? And therefore, and this is done by Doppler effect. Right? You know the velocities of stars. So you look at other galaxies too. This, Vera Rubin showed this for many, many galaxies. Look at other galaxies. You look at the velocity of rotation of stars around the center of the galaxy as a function of radius. And then from the, what you see in the optical, you can predict how much mass there should be at within certain radii or the mass profile. And from there, you can predict how the velocity of rotation will fall as you go away from the center of the galaxy. And she showed that in almost every case, it did not fall, but it was constant, right? Which meant that there's more mass than you could see or observe. And this is dark matter. So dark matter, one of the main, of course, the many more evidences for it now. But the strongest evidence came from uh, rotation curves, uh, which, which is basically, the, and, and if you have a small radio telescope, you can do this experiment yourself, right? So this is something which is not very difficult to show and it's not difficult to understand, right? So it's a very simple uh, effect. And now I'm going to talk about one last effect of Doppler effect, then we move on to something else. I know I'm already running out of time, uh, but I thought this is something all of you know. Uh, Hubble, of course, famously showed that farther away a galaxy is, the heart, uh, he showed that all galaxies seem to be going away from us, like they don't like us. And he also showed, and this was of course known before by, by Schliffer, but Hubble was the first to show that farther away the galaxy was, the faster it seemed to go away from us. And there's a linear relationship. And now we know this is Hubble constant, which is the constant to convert from distance to velocity, at least in the nearby universe, right? And this was one of the, this was the major proof for, for the Big Bang Theory. Uh, we know that the universe started around 13.7 billion years ago. It was very, very dense, very, very small, and, and very, very hot. And as it expanded, uh, it became cooler and larger, of course, and 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 because the universe is homogeneous, homogeneous, which means that it's the same everywhere, roughly, and isotropic, which means it looks the same roughly everywhere, whichever direction you look. This expansion implies that anywhere you are in the universe, in any galaxy, you will see that every galaxy moving away from you, following up. That's all, right? It has to do. And this again is something which you get from the Doppler effect. Right? How do you know how fast an object is moving away from you from Doppler? And the observations are very, very carefully done, but again, this is in some sense, a simple uh, application of the observed effects, right? Uh, now, the next, uh, now, I want to move, shift topic to something which is connected to spectroscopy, but not Doppler, which is that of thermodynamics. And I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, so I'll just probably go quickly. We, I, we, we saw that different stars are different colors, and they're classified differently called OTA, GKM, and, and at some point, uh, not, uh, Hertzsprung and Russell plotted the known stars at that time. They plotted the luminosity of the star, how bright the star is, versus temperature of the star, or how what color it is. 
and they found that most stars kind of follow this thing called the mean sequence. Most stars lie in a band where the hotter the star is, the, the, the more luminous it is. And they also found out very quickly that the hotter the star and more luminous the star is, the more massive also it is, at least on the main sequence. Right? And all, all of this needed explanation. Remember, at that time, they did not even know about nuclear fusion. Right? They did not know how the star is stable, whether it's stable, how, how you know, anything. Right? And so slowly, of course, people started applying thermodynamics. But the fact that you could apply known thermal physics uh, or thermodynamics to a star itself was revolutionary. And a lot of that work was done by Lane and Emkin and then Eddington and so on. Uh, and that itself was a, why would you be able to explain something as, as, as amazing as a star with just thermal physics? What you put, and that's the beauty of it, right? And in some sense, you know, very, very basic understanding can be done in just these four equations, right? You have to study equilibrium mass conservation, energy conservation, and how does energy get run? And you could then explain the structure of a star without even knowing what, uh, what, uh, what was the cause of the energy uh, itself, right? And that, 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 that's the really difference. And then slowly the understanding came that a star is stable. And the star is stable because there are two opposing forces acting on them, right? One of them is, and, and the star is stable because the center, center of the star, there's nuclear fusion. And in a sun, protons fuse to form helium. In, in more massive stars, higher elements form, fuse to form even higher elements and so on. And this energy production is restricted from the core of the star. And this then produces, then of course, heats up the star. At this temperature, then heats up the plasma, the, the ionized. And plasma, since the ionized, it behaves like an ideal gas almost, and and they get hotter and hotter, right, in the center. And then this, and the energy then dissipates outwards. Now, as, it, as the energy dissipates outwards, the star star uh, gets heated, of course, and 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 in some sense, and therefore this can push the star out and then become bigger and bigger and bigger. But of course, that is not true because the star has its own gravity, it's very massive, and therefore the self gravity of the star tries to push it inside, inward, 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 and contract. And when these forces uh, match exactly the star is stable. Right? So the force due to the pressure of gas pressure, because the kinetic energy of the of the gas in the star due to the fusion energy, uh, balances balances the fact that it it wants to contract because of its own gravity, right? And it's stable, and it's stable, and this stability is called hydrostatic equilibrium. And there are some various weird effects of it. For example, you can show that in principle, you know, Virial theorem will give you that the star has negative specific heat. And so on. I will not talk about it. Okay. And what I show you below are for the sun. Uh, as a function of radius, how does density, temperature, mass, and pressure drop? And you can see that, of course, it's hottest and most dense and highest pressure in the core because that's where energy is produced. And, and, and it decreases as you go along. But, of course, you know, the mass of the star builds up as you go on. Right? So that, that, that's basically what all of the all applying thermal physics to, to basically a, a, a ball of gas. Right? You, are, you model a ball of gas like you model any ball of gas. And then you get a star. And you can even predict the structure of the star. If you predict these curves, these curves can be predicted by the equations I showed you here. And, and, and that's pretty cool. Now, I'll skip, I'll, I'll skip this, but I just want to mention that, uh, that this, the, the star is stable because the gra gravity is balanced by pressure. And pressure comes from the energy generation at the center. Now, what happens is energy generation stops, would it stop, right? Because uh, in, in, our star, in our sun, for example, protons fuse to form helium, and they can do that because it's very, very hot inside, around 15 million Kelvin in the center of the star. But supposing all the all the protons form helium in the core, and there are no more free protons, right? The core becomes completely helium. Then what happens? Then gravity gravity still exists, but then the pressure reduces because there's no more energy production, and therefore gravity will win and will compress. Right? When it compresses, if it becomes hot enough, again, it, then it will become even hotter when it compresses the gas. And if it's hot enough, then helium could then start fusing to form carbon. In our sun, it won't happen because our sun's core will not become hot enough for helium to fuse. But stars more massive than the sun, that will happen, right? So then helium is fused into carbon. If you look at the left side figure, and then at some point, all the helium will get exhausted, it will become carbon or something like that. Then, then the star again will start contracting because suddenly the gravity is more than the pressure, and then it becomes hotter, and then carbon fuses to form other elements and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is how a star evolves, right? Uh, and of course, sun will not do that. And again, so all of so how do you know all of this? All of this you can this is called stellar evolution. All of this you can predict or you can make and compute based on basically apply, looking at this equation to see how these equations evolve with time based on the based on the time evolution of the energy uh, energy production. Right? So all of it is basically you no know, thermodynamics plus a little bit of quantum mechanics, and and you can actually figure out how a star forms, how a star is structured, how a star evolves. And nothing very complicated in that sense, physics. Right? So that I think is really cool. Uh, and in fact, all of this was all of this was done even before people knew that uh, stars uh, have energy from fusion. 
even without knowing the cause, they could they could figure out because it's the ball of gas. Now, therefore, when it's exhausted, of course, energy generation stops in schools and so on and so forth. Like you saw, right? Now, what happens? How does end with this? I think end with, and then I'll talk about thermal energy of the universe. Now, of course, we all know from maybe high school or college that uh, that of course, you know, things fuse to form heavier and heavier nuclei. But then the binding energy of iron is the highest, right? And therefore, if you start burning, and therefore, still iron when you when you when the fusion because binding energy is, is, is becomes higher, then there is it is just released, and therefore you have excess energy. After that, you need energy to actually fuse high iron into heavier, and therefore it cannot happen by itself, right? And therefore, because endothermic, and therefore once it forms iron, it cannot fuse. This process cannot go on, and iron cannot fuse to form heavier elements in the core of the sun, right? And therefore, then what happens? Then, then there's no energy production. Then gravity takes over, and gravity compresses things. So what happens when it does that? Right? Something has to resist gravity. If nothing resists gravity, it will collapse and form a black hole. Like we all know, right? There are two things which resist gravity before it does that, and one of and both are both are called degeneration pressure. It's the, the same process, and the second comes from quantum mechanics, right? And there's something of course on the famous one. I'll come to that in a bit. Uh, some of you, I think, I think more from chemistry than physics, you know about the Pauli exclusion principle. Electrons are fermions, and therefore, you know, they can't occupy the same energy. Two electrons can't occupy the same energy state, and therefore, if you if you compress them and make them do that, at some point, energy one of energy has to increase, right? So what happens in a star like a sun, for example, where, uh, or or any other star where there's no more nuclear fusion possible, then then gravity starts com com compressing material. And at some point, it doesn't have to become black hole. It's much before it becomes a black hole, what happens is that then all the electrons, because the pressure, all the electrons kind of get free of, of the of the atoms, because atoms are very, very close to each other. They almost touch, right? And therefore, density becomes more and more. And then the electrons kind of become free inside. And 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 because and then you compress the electrons, and then you want to put them into the ground state, right? But then the Pauli exclusion principle, which means that they can't all occupy the same energy state. And therefore, as you compress the electrons, the pressure becomes more, and the energy becomes more. And, and this and this because energy becomes more, the pressure becomes more, and this pressure due to the energy of the electrons becoming higher because they can't all stay at the lower energy state because of the principle. Then this pressure then starts balancing the gravity. This is called degeneracy, electron degeneracy pressure. But then I told you this happens when the atoms almost touch each other, right? Which means this gets very very dense. How dense? It's basically, uh, the white dwarfs have a mass of roughly the sun, but they are as big as the earth. That tells you how dense they are, right? Sirius is Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, and Sirius famously has a white dwarf companion. This is an image taken from the The central bright star is Sirius. The four crosses are, 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 are optical effects from the telescope, and the arrow points to a very, very tiny object, which is Sirius B. And Sirius B is a white dwarf, right? One of the first white dwarfs discovered. And 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 this I'll go through with the questions. I mean, all this is again something I wanted to talk to you about in terms of you know, when you, what happens when you combine thermodynamics and, and quantum mechanics and apply it to astronomy. But I think uh, we are running out of time. Uh, and therefore, uh, what Chandrasekhar did, Chandrasekhar, what Chandrasekhar famously did was then he applied he applied uh, special special relativity as well as as well as degeneracy pressure to stellar structure equations, which he knew really really well and solved them. Famously solved them on a, on a one month trip by ship to England from Madras. And then he realized that uh, the electron degeneracy pressure can only resist gravity up to a point. Okay? So if the, if the mass of the core becomes more than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, then then electron degeneracy pressure is no longer able to able to resist gravity. And then he said he doesn't know what happened after that. Edicton famously said uh, completely wrong and so on and so forth. Later, Chandrasekhar got to write and he got the Nobel Prize for it in the in the 80s. Right. So what happens actually is that then then the electrons start being forced into the into the nuclei and the electron capture the all the protons become neutrons and then neutron degeneracy pressure takes over and and you form what is called a neutron star which you also sometimes know as the pulse star right and of course if even and that also has a limit and beyond that limit of course you get a black hole right so I'll stop there with this and then I'll just go through very quickly thermal history I'll just take five minutes more I'm sorry uh, so we, again, we, we talked about the Big Bang, which we know, which we knew partly because of Hubble, which uh, Hubble's uh, discovery that galaxies farther away moving, moving faster away from us, right? And now we know uh, all of it put together as a Big Bang theory, which, and we know that the, that the universe started 13.7 billion years ago and it cooled as it expanded, and 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 it's basically plasma at one temperature initially because everything was in thermodynamic equilibrium, the particles and the and the photons. Drawn thermodynamic equilibrium and the constitution or the composition of the universe depended on the temperature, right? So very very high temperature. It was 
uh, it was the elementary particles completely, and then as it cooled, then you could have then, then you could have both individual protons and neutrons and electrons and so on. And as it cooled even further, uh, uh, and at some point, protons, electrons, and photons went over an equilibrium, which meant that the photons kept being absorbed by electrons all the time, uh, and which meant that therefore you couldn't see the photon because the photons were absorbed by electrons very very quickly, and then re-emitted and then absorbed very quickly. So on, which meant that the universe was opaque, right? At some point, the, the universe cooled sufficiently that the electrons and protons could combine to form atoms without being broken apart again by the kinetic energy of the particles around them. And as soon as they formed atoms, photons could then just zip by the, the atoms, and, this, and then the universe became transparent. This is called the era of recombination. That happened around 380,000 years ago at redshift around 1100. And at that time, when the photons were no longer being repeatedly absorbed by the electrons and protons in equilibrium, and the, uh, the photons could just pass by the atoms freely, then suddenly the universe became transparent. And before that, the universe was opaque, right? And this and this division is called the last scattering surface. And the radiation from this last scattering surface is what we now know as the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, this radiation, therefore, is said to decouple from matter because it then evolved independent of matter. It wasn't coupled to matter in, in equilibrium. And therefore, because it evolved independent of matter, it, its temperature evolved differently as time went by than before, and it evolved as one plus z, right? And and therefore, that therefore this this radiation which was in thermal equilibrium at some temperature with the matter, then started cooling. It was still in equilibrium with itself, which means it still had a constant temperature almost, but that temperature cooled as one plus z, and now it's cooled sufficiently that it it's now at uh, 2.7 Kelvin or 3 Kelvin. This is the famous 3 Kelvin uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. It's still a black body because remember it came from thermal thermodynamic And the middle figure on top is the spe observed spectrum of the black body radiation, of course, uh, of, of PMG. And the error bars are blown up by a factor of 1000. Okay. The most precise observations, measurement of any black body radiation in the lab is of the cosmic microwave background radiation. It follows it at, some, at, at a level of 1 in 10 power 4 or something, right? But of course, now we know that if we subtract out the smooth thing, there are variations in some place to place, and that is the map at the bottom left. You all know very well. I will not go into that. Right. So therefore, this. So therefore, though, therefore, if you if you you can apply thermodynamic equilibrium and thermodynamics to the universe at every time as it expanded, and depending on the temperature, you can predict the state of the matter, the equation of state, what impacts with what, etc., and so on. And then you could then at some point predict what. And Gamow famously predicted that you should see this relic radiation, which is an observed by Penzias and Wilson, and there's a Nobel Prize for that, right? And this, therefore, now, and this was, this was de decoupled at around 1,100 redshift, and now it's cooler, as it could remember the black body, as it cools, the peak of the uh, of the emission keeps shifting to longer wavelengths, and it started off at peaking at the infrared, near infrared, now it's peaking at the microwave, right? At roughly a few, uh, 250 to 300 gigahertz. And this, again, is, 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 uh, is in some sense, redshift, right? You can think of it as the infrared peak, uh, radiation at 1100 redshift being redshifted to the microwave now by just one plus it, right? So that's, that's, that's the same, that's essentially the same. So I'll stop here. So I hopefully I conveyed, I've taken three topics. One is uh, the Doppler effect, the third, second is uh, spectrum and what the spectrum will tell you about elemental composition and therefore its physical parameters. And thirdly, what happens if you apply these principles to stars and then to the entire universe. And I, I hope to, I hope I convinced you that spectroscopy, therefore, truly was the beginning of astrophysics. And this is a few examples. Uh, it's not as if all of this covers all of astrophysics. I just want to give you a flavor of, of some of these and link them to what you know from elsewhere, but link them back to the physics that gave rise to this. So I'll stop.